Hello friends, my dear students and the members of the fraternity of physiology and medicine, my dear colleagues, hope you all are doing well, staying safe in this trying and testing times. Uh, a student pointed out that uh, there are not many uh, endocrine videos uh, on the channel. So therefore, I thought uh, let us have some endocrine videos and starting with the very basic the topic is mechanism of hormone action. Right. We will first start with the basic understanding and then we will go to the next step and that is actually the mechanism of hormone action. So, let us begin with the basics. You know every system in the body, uh, the organ system, it contributes in its own way toward the homeostasis. So, there is cardiovascular system, respiratory system, digestive system and so on. But the functioning of all these systems is regulated by the two systems which are the nervous system and the endocrine system. Well, that is very basic. If we compare the functioning of nervous system and the endocrine system, the nervous system is a faster regulating system whereas endocrine system is a slower regulating system. Why is that? Because nervous system uh, controls the functions by the way of nerves and nerve signals, impulses, which can be transmitted very rapidly. Whereas the endocrine system uh, functions by the way of hormones, hormones which are released by the endocrine glands. They circulate throughout the body uh, via bloodstream, they are carried to the distant organs and they will act on those uh, target cells. So, uh, if I were to give you an example to understand this uh, action of hormones, imagine a radio station. There is some program going on in that uh, FM radio station and uh, the waves, the, those radio waves emanating from the station are present everywhere in the atmosphere. They are surrounding us, they are everywhere. But who will be able to uh, hear that uh, radio station or listen to the program? The person whose radio set is on, switched on and is tuned to that frequency. Alright, only that person will be able to hear that program. So, similarly, hormones are circulating in the via the bloodstream throughout the body. They are reaching every cell. But which cell will respond to that particular hormone? The cell that has got specific receptor for a particular hormone. And therefore, uh, this discussion about the mechanism of hormone action will mainly revolve around the receptors. It is the receptor that is the most important core of this particular topic. Right. So, let us first uh, look at some of the basics. As uh, we already know in the classic endocrine signaling, hormone uh, is released b uh, into the bloodstream and it circulates throughout the body. It acts on the target uh, cells which are at a distance. Whereas, there is also something called as paracrine signaling. So, hormone released by one cell, uh, the ligand, the chemical or the hormone released by one cell and it acts on the adjacent cell. Which means what? Which means it does not have to go through the bloodstream to reach the target cell. It is just uh, acting on the adjacent cell. That is called as paracrine signal. And then of course, there is also autocrine signaling where uh, the chemical, the ligand is released by one cell and that chemical acts on that cell itself which released uh, the chemical in the first place that is called as autocrine, auto. So, names are quite suggestive para, auto and so on. Right. Uh, what are paraneoplastic syndromes? Um, well, there are certain neoplastic cells which uh, are non-endocrine cells but they release the endocrine factors or hormones. These are called as paraneoplastic syndromes. Uh, for instance, squamous cell carcinoma of the lung or oat cell carcinoma of the lung. These are non-endocrine cells 
but they are known to release the hormones. For instance, uh, they release PTHRP, PTH related peptide. So, this peptide released by the squamous cell carcinoma of the lung, it has the actions which are similar to the PTH, parathyroid hormone or parathormone. And therefore, it will result in hypercalcemia. So, this particular mal malignancy will be associated with, the hy with hypercalcemia. Right. So, these are called as paraneoplastic syndromes. The neoplastic cells which are non-endocrine basically, but they release endocrine factors or hormones. If we look at uh, the three divisions or arms of the endocrine system, uh, first is the dedicated endocrine glands. They will synthesize and release those bioactive hormones. So, uh, majority of the functions are uh, based on these uh, dedicated endocrine glands and the hormones released by them. So, there is a thyroid gland, there is an adrenal gland and these are dedicated glands with uh, the only function uh, is to release the hormones. So, that is one arm or one division of the endocrine system. The other division is non-endocrine organs which in, uh, additionally they release hormone and perform endocrine function. So, their, uh, the point is their primary function is not endocrine. For example, kidney. Kidney synthesizes erythropoietin. So, that is uh, apart from its primary function. Or uh, heart. Heart is not a primary endocrine gland, but it releases atrial natriuretic factor uh, or atrial natriuretic peptide, which is a hormone. Therefore, that is another uh, division of the endocrine system. And the third is a third division of the endocrine system is the cells which are present in various organs and they modify the inactive precursors into the active hormones. So, uh, for instance, formation of angiotensin 2 in the lungs. So, lungs release an enzyme called ACE which convert angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. So, even lung is playing its own part in the endocrine signaling in a way or um, vitamin D3, how it is formed, uh, liver and kidney is involved in the hydroxylation reaction which will finally form the vitamin uh, D, most active form of vitamin D. Therefore, uh, they play their part in uh, final formation of the hormone, although they are themselves not the endocrine glands. Right. Let us see some of the general concepts of uh, endocrine control, the functions of the hormones. Most hormones have several different target tissues and uh, they, they are said to have pleiotropic actions that is multiple phenotypic effects. Uh, what is the chemical nature or structure of the hormones? Now, now we are entering the core area of, uh, for this particular topic. The chemical nature or the structure of the hormones, based on this the hormones can be divided into these categories. The hormones may be peptides, the hormones may be steroids or hormones may be derived from a single amino acid. So, three uh, large categories. We are talking about the chemical structure of a hormone and based on that we can divide the hormones into these three large categories. There will be subcategories in those, but basically the hormones uh, can be divided as either the peptide or protein hormones, that is one. Uh, then steroid hormones, the metabolites of cholesterol or derived from the cholesterol, that is the second category and the third one derivatives of a single amino acid and that single amino acid is tyrosine. So, hormones derived from uh, tyrosine. Well, the hormones derived from tyrosine 
are uh, catecholamines and the thyroid hormones. Then steroids or metabolites of cholesterol, synthesis of these hormones necessitates a number of enzymatic steps. Uh, synthesis of steroid hormones require uh, certain enzymatic steps and therefore only very specialized cells which harbor these enzymes uh, will be able to synthesize those steroid hormones synthesized from the cholesterol. So, uh, adrenal cortex gland, uh, glucocorticoids, mineralocorticoids, uh, sex steroids and therefore uh, that is another major category of hormones, the steroid hormones derived from cholesterol and synthesized by very specific cell types. And the third category, now here uh, there are subcategories, peptide hormones, proteins or proteoglycans. So let us see the subcategories in this, the uh, peptide hormone families are as follows, there is one the insulin family, structurally similar therefore they belong to those families or subcategories. We are talking about the peptide or protein hormones, we have already seen the other two categories, uh, derivatives of a single amino acid tyrosine, uh, the thyroid hormones and catecholamines. Then metabolites of cholesterol or called as steroid hormones. Uh, glucocorticoids, mineralocorticoids, sex steroids, adrenal cortex gland uh, is a major gland that secretes these hormones, synthesizes and secretes. And then the third one, proteins or peptides or proteoglycans, uh, here there are these families. One is insulin family, it has insulin, then IGFs, insulin like growth factors, you know uh, growth hormone. Uh, action is mediated by these IGFs, insulin like growth factors and relaxin. These are the hormones um, in the insulin family. Then we have glycoprotein family, uh, these are glycoprotein hormones. So basically structurally similar hormones have been put into these subcategories. Um, so FSH, LH, gonadotropins, uh, then the TSH and HCG, these are glycoprotein hormones. Then we have growth hormone family, uh, growth hormone family of course has growth hormone and prolactin and uh, HPL, uh, human placental lactogen or HCS, human chorionic uh, somatomammotropin. Again structurally similar hormones put into this category, growth hormone family and the fourth one is secretin family. In this we have secretin, uh, glucagon, VIP and GIP, vasoactive intestinal polypeptide and uh, uh, GIP, gastric inhibitory peptide. Right, so these are the hormones and their categories and subcategories. Uh, peptide and protein hormones, they vary greatly in size. There are various sizes, uh, on one end of the spectrum there is a hormone like TRH which is a tripeptide and on the other hand there are large uh, peptide hormones like a growth hormone with 191 amino acids or HCG which has got more than 200 amino acids. So uh, their sizes would vary. Now coming to the uh, synthesis of hormones and the general principles. You know uh, peptide hormones are generally synthesized in the precursor forms. Uh, you know the hormones synthesized and secreted by the anti-repetitory gland, the peptide hormones, they are generally synthesized in the form of a pre precursor hormone or pre-hormone or pre-pro-hormone. Let us take the example of insulin, insulin is synthesized as pre-pro-insulin, then it will be cleaved first to form a pro-hormone, in this case pro-insulin, uh, 
and another cleavage uh, will eventually form the active hormone insulin. Uh, finally, the hormone will be synthesized. So, majority of the peptide or protein hormones are synthesized like this, starting with an inactive precursor and then uh, eventually the active form of hormone is uh, or rather active hormone is formed from the inactive precursor. Right. Second point that should be noted as uh, the, that these peptide or protein hormones, they are synthesized and then they are stored into that gland and then only when the stimulus arrives, this peptide or protein hormone will be released. Insulin, growth hormone, all these peptide hormones, once they are synthesized, uh, the hormone is stored into that gland and when the signal arrives, for instance in the case of insulin, only when the blood glucose increases and then uh, there is a signal for the insulin release, only then the hormone uh, is released by uh, mostly by exocytosis. So, this release is on demand and uh, this uh, is called as stimulus secretion coupling. Uh, the hormone is going to be uh, secreted on demand and this particular event is called a stimulus secretion coupling that there is a stimulus for the hormone and only then the protein or peptide hormone will be secreted. Compare this with steroid hormones. Steroid hormones are the metabolites of cholesterol, you know circulating um, LDLs, circulating low density lipoproteins are taken up by the adrenal cortex gland or steroid synthesizing uh, gland and uh, from this LDL cholesterol, the steroid hormones are synthesized. Once they are synthesized, they are not stored, they are immediately released into the circulation. So, it is a big, big difference. Peptide or protein hormones synthesized and stored in the gland and only when a stimulus arrives, they are released. Steroid hormones, uh, they are synthesized and not stored in the gland, they are immediately released into the circulation. So, the stimulus is for their synthesis and not for their release. Let me just explain this point again. Peptide or protein hormones synthesized and stored within the gland and when the stimulus arrives, they will be released into the circulation. Steroid hormones, uh, they are synthesized and not stored, immediately released into the circulation. So, for peptide hormone, the stimulus, the signal is for their release, their secretion. Whereas, in the case of steroid hormones, the stimulus, the signal or the stimulus is for their synthesis. And what I mean by that is the enzymes, you know, whenever there is a steroid hormone required, there would be upregulation of the enzymes which are going to be involved in the synthesis of steroid hormones. And uh, those enzymes would then uh, catalyze the reactions and steroid hormones will be synthesized. So, uh, steroid hormones, uh, the, the signal for them is for their synthesis and once they are synthesized, uh, they will be immediately released into the circulation. I think I have mentioned this point twice now. Uh, let me just tell you the logic behind it. Look, steroids and this is very important, you must understand, you must note this fact. Steroid hormones are lipid soluble, mark this point. Steroid hormones are lipid soluble whereas protein or peptide hormones are not lipid soluble, poorly lipid soluble, they are water soluble. So, the steroid hormones and you know all our cell membranes are basically made up of lipid bilayer. So, consider this, steroid hormone is synthesized by a particular cell. Now, this cell will not be able to store the steroid hormone for the simple reason that 
द स्टीरोड हॉर्मोन कैन एस्केप दिस सेल इजीली बिकॉज द स्टीरोड्स आर लिपिड सोल्यूबल एंड द सेल मेम्ब्रेन्स आर मेड अप ऑफ लिपिड बायलेयर्स सो देर फॉर स्टीरोड के नॉट बी स्टोर्ड विद इन द सेल्स विच सिंथिसाइज दैम वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट डिफ्रेंशिएटिंग फीचर बिटवीन द पेप्टाइड एंड स्टीरोड हॉर्मोन्स um coming to another point for these hormones and that is a latent period for the hormone action what is meant by latent period it's the it's the time interval between the application of stimulus and the onset of action of that hormone that's called as latent period and uh, this varies from hormone to hormone for instance the shortest latent period is uh, for a hormone like oxytocin you know oxytocin is involved in milk ejection reflex so uh, when a baby starts suckling at the breast the signals are sent and the hormone oxytocin is released in uh, from the posterior pituitary gland it takes hardly a few seconds so latent period is very very short whereas uh, in the case of thyroxin the latent period can be 2 to 3 days i mean when a person enters cold uh, cold room or cold atmosphere the heat production should increase in the body that's possible by the way of action of thyroid hormones so the thyroxin release has to increase entering the cold is the stimulus for thyroid hormone to be released into the circulation and increase the bmr so that uh, heat can be generated in the body latent period for the thyroid hormone release and its action is 2 to 3 days long so uh, the point was there's difference uh, in the latent periods for various hormones uh, one more aspect is hormones can circulate either as free hormone in the plasma or bound to plasma proteins you know uh, steroid hormones they are bound to plasma proteins and uh, what happens is because of this kind of binding their half life increases whereas peptide or protein hormones they are themselves proteins so they do not further bind to the proteins in the plasma they circulate free in the free form in the plasma therefore remember uh, hormones like insulin like growth hormone and other such hormones which are proteins or peptides they circulate as free hormones in the plasma their half lives are short insulin growth hormone uh very few minutes uh 2 to 5 minutes catecholamines have shortest half life or uh, circulation life uh, a few seconds whereas steroids have a very long half life you know a hormone like vitamin d it's a steroid hormone it has got longest half life almost uh, 15 days or 2 weeks so uh, that's that's a differentiating feature between protein and uh, peptide hormones versus steroid hormones a uh, well thyroid is a third category derivative of a single amino acid tyrosine i mean uh, it's derived from tyrosine this thyroid hormone thyroid hormones are also bound uh, to the plasma proteins right well uh, let me just uh, add an exception here we said just now that the proteins or peptide hormones are uh, not bound to proteins in the plasma they themselves are proteins and therefore they have very short half life the reason being that proteins or peptide hormones are already stored uh, in their own cells in their own endocrine cells which synthesize those hormones so then they will just be released when there is stimulus they will act on the target cell and that's it that is what is needed of them and therefore they don't need an extensive plasma protein binding they don't need an extensive half life in the plasma whereas steroid hormones as i uh, said just now 
that they could not be stored in those endocrine cells which synthesize them and therefore steroid hormones need a temporary storage form in the plasma and therefore plasma protein binding provides that uh, temporary storage form in the plasma for the steroid hormones. So remember this uh, plasma protein binding and what is its significance basically it extends the half life in the plasma. Well, let me just add one uh, exception. The IGFs, insulin like growth factors, IGF 1 and IGF 2, these are the exceptions. These are hormone, uh, the protein hormones by themselves, but they do bind to uh, plasma proteins. So, this is an exception. Well, I said proteins or peptide hormones, they do not, uh, do not get bound to the plasma proteins. But here is an exception, the IGFs, insulin-like growth factors. So, basically, uh, plasma protein binding provides a temporary storage form uh, in the blood for that particular hormone and it extends the half-life of that hormone. It provides uh, some kind of a reservoir of that hormone. Uh, in the plasma, right. So, uh, let us take one more point, hormonal rhythms. Most of the hormones, they exhibit circadian rhythm or diurnal rhythm. I have already uploaded one video related to the circadian rhythm and uh, what is the physiologic basis for circadian rhythm. Hormones follow 24 hour cycle and it is called as circadian rhythm. So, cortisol, you know, uh, cortisol levels are highest in the morning hours, uh, 5 a.m. or 6 a.m. and lowest in the evening and then again highest in the next morning. So, you know, uh, 24 hour cycle. Whereas, uh, some hormones, they also follow what is called as ultradian rhythms. Ultradian rhythms with, uh, rhythms with a periodicity of less than 24 hours. So, you might see uh, two or three peaks of the, uh, those hormones in a 24 hour duration. So, LH, FSH, testosterone, the steroid hormones would, uh, I mean these, these uh, the steroid hormone testosterone and the LH, FSH, the protein or peptides, they show this kind of ultradian rhythm. Now, with all that, let us come to the big one or, or the important topic, the core concept the mechanism of hormone action. So, if you were going to write some answer in, in some exam, a 4 mark, 5 mark answer, it should actually start from this point, the mechanism of hormone action. So, from this point onward, we are actually going to discuss how the hormones exert their uh, effects or harm, uh, actions on the target cells. Well, let us start. As we have said, the first point, all the hormones exert their specific actions on the target cells by binding to specific receptors. So, there has to be specific receptor protein. A receptor is a target biomolecule to which the hormone is going to bind and only then the effect can be exerted by that particular hormone. Broadly, the receptors are of two types. Uh, in a broad sense, there are two types of receptors. The cell membrane receptors present on the cell membrane and the intracellular receptors. So, uh, what is, uh, why there are these two types of receptors or uh, why the locations are different? Look, again very simple, proteins or peptide hormones, they are not lipid soluble and since they are not lipid soluble, they cannot enter the target cell easily. Let us say here is a protein hormone, it cannot enter the target cell easily because it is not lipid soluble and the cell membranes are made up of lipid bilayer. 
and therefore its receptor is located in the cell membrane itself so that this hormone doesn't have to cross the cell membrane it doesn't have to enter the cell to exert the effect because it cannot enter the cell easily it's not lipid uh, soluble this particular or uh, the proteins or peptide hormones are not lipid soluble so either the receptor can be in the cell membrane and that is the case with protein or peptide hormones or the receptor uh, which is intracellular so uh, two basic types of receptors cell membrane receptors intracellular receptors now look uh, intracellular receptor means it could be intracytoplasmic receptor or a nuclear receptor receptor inside the nucleus uh, steroid hormones have intracellular receptors because as we said steroids are lipid soluble they can cross the lipid bilayer easily uh, so they can enter the target cell very very easily therefore their receptors are inside the cell inside the cell either it could be cytoplasm uh, that the receptor is uh, present or intranuclear receptor uh, glucocorticoids and mineralocorticoids generally have a cytoplasmic receptor estrogen progesterone generally have uh, or they have nuclear receptor estrogen has nuclear receptor um, thyroid hormones although they don't belong to the category of steroids thyroids are derived from amino acid tyrosine single amino acid yet the thyroid receptor is an intranuclear receptor so well is, is that clear now peptide or protein hormones cell membrane receptors uh, glucocorticoids and mineralocorticoids intracytoplasmic receptor so steroids uh, and uh, estrogen progesterone or sex steroids they have intranuclear receptor thyroid hormone as well it has got intranuclear receptor so that is basically um, the the location of the receptor and as we have mentioned the reason for that so so let's now talk about the cell membrane receptors uh, proteins and the peptide hormones they have cell membrane receptors so what happens in the case of these hormones they combine with this cell membrane receptor and then some other ligand some other chemical will be formed inside the cell inside the target cell which would then be called as a second messenger right so the hormone the protein or peptide hormone itself would be called as the first messenger and then when it combines with the receptor in the cell membrane it will form some other chemical within the cell which will be the second messenger so that's uh, what is the second messenger system and it's applicable uh, to the protein or peptide hormones so let's see the cell membrane receptors uh, now this is the more complex part of this discussion so let's try to understand this the cell membrane receptors uh, of course for the protein and peptide hormones they are of two types so listen to this part carefully and then try to understand even the cell membrane receptors are of two types what are they let's try to understand look uh, one type is called as g protein coupled receptor gpcr so let's say here is a peptide or protein hormone and it has got a receptor which is coupled with a g protein so there is a g protein and there is a receptor which is coupled with this protein 
and this uh, G protein is going to act as a mediator to generate the second messenger inside the cell. That is one major category of cell membrane receptors. In fact, let me tell you more than 1000 ligands and hormones have been identified uh, which have G protein coupled receptor GPCR. The other type of the cell membrane receptor is called as catalytic receptor. Catalytic receptor means here is a hormone that combines with the receptor, hormone uh, combining with the receptor in the cell membrane. The receptor itself has some enzymatic activity or the receptor itself is associated with some enzymatic complex within the cell. The cytoplasmic tail of this receptor is associated with some enzyme complex and then therefore, uh, therefore it is called as a catalytic receptor. The receptor itself has catalytic activity. Let me just uh, tell you the difference between the two. When we say G protein coupled receptor, receptor by itself does not have any uh, action per se. Receptor is uh, bound to G protein, that is why we call it G protein coupled receptor. Um, and therefore, then the G protein is the mediator for the receptor. It is the G protein which will activate some enzyme inside the cell and then the formation of second messenger will occur and uh, then the effects of the hormones will be visible. Hormone is the first messenger of course. Right. So, that is the difference between these two categories. Hope you are you have uh, taken this very basic point clearly. Receptor having no activity of its own, it is just associated with a G protein, that is a G protein coupled receptor GPCR. Catalytic receptor means receptor has intrinsically uh, some kind of an enzymatic activity. So, it is going to act in the on the intracellular proteins, proteins inside the cell and effect of the hormone uh, will be exhibited. So, these are the two types. Now, moving further, let us uh, look at these receptors one by one, the G protein coupled receptor. Um, well, this uh, is an intermediary as I mentioned, the G protein. It is a GTP binding protein, G protein, it is also called as heterotrimeric G protein. Let us uh, understand this further. If we have to show a cell membrane and uh, here is a hormone, the receptor is called as serpentine receptor. Now, I am, I am specifically talking about G protein coupled receptor. We have already divided the cell membrane receptors into two types. Now, we are talking about the first type, the GPCR. So, the receptor is called as a serpentine receptor because of its appearance, the serpentine and therefore, it is uh, called as serpentine receptor. It spans the membrane seven times. It spans the membrane seven times. It has got seven transmembrane segments. I am talking about the receptor. So, uh, seven transmembrane segments or the receptor spans the membrane seven times and therefore, sometimes its intracellular products, I mean when the hormone combines with the receptor and the second messenger is generated inside the cell, those products inside the cell are sometimes called as SOS. I am going to explain this SOS. 
sons of seven, you know, uh, SOS is uh, SOS signaling when the ship is sinking or the or the or a plane is nose diving. There is a distress signal in the form of SOS. Or even in the medicine, one tablet SOS means as and when required. But it has got one more meaning, this SOS, sons of seven. So cyclic AMP, which is going to be generated when the hormone combines with the receptor. Cyclic AMP is the second messenger generated inside the cell. Sometimes it is called as son of seven. What is that seven? Uh, seven transmembrane segments of the receptor. The product of that, the sun. So, sun of seven. Anyways, um, so receptor is this and it is coupled to the G protein. This is a G protein. It is GTP binding protein. It is also called as hetero trimeric G protein, heterotrimeric, trimeric three subunits, hetero is they are hetero in structure, structurally hetero different. So, heterotrimeric G protein, it has got three subunits, alpha, beta, gamma. So, alpha, beta, gamma, three subunits of G protein. Now, the picture must be clear. Hormone is going to be combining with the receptor. Receptor is coupled with this G protein which is the mediator. Uh, so, a G protein or GTP binding protein. Now, inactive form, well, uh, let us uh, look at what happens actually. Whenever this protein hormone comes and combines with the cell membrane receptor, this serpentine receptor, the G protein is going to be activated. So, when there was no hormone, when there was no signal, uh, no hormone was arriving at the target cell, the G protein was in inactive form and in inactive form, it is bound to the GDP. But when hormone arrives, and combines with its receptor, now the G protein is activated, it is going to be in the active form. So, it will dissociate from GDP and it will bind the GTP. So, that is why its G protein is called as also GTP binding protein. So, in the active form, it is going to uh, bind the GTP. Once that happens, next step is the alpha subunit. This alpha subunit of the G protein, it dissociates from the other two subunits that is beta and gamma subunits. So, alpha subunit will dissociate from the other two subunits and it will move along the membrane. This is just a representative diagram. So, alpha subunit will dissociate from the other two subunits of the G protein and it will move along the cell membrane. This alpha subunit then will activate an effector protein inside the cell. That effector protein could be adenylyl cyclase enzyme, right? Uh, I repeat once again. The G protein in its inactive form, when there was no hormone arriving at the cell, the G protein was bound to the GDP. And when the hormone arrives, now the hormone has to exert its action on the target cell. Then uh, GDP is uh, dissociated and G, uh, the, the G protein will bound to the GTP. It is a GTP binding protein. Now the alpha subunit will dissociate, right? Hormone is bound to the receptor. Now, there is a GTP binding, alpha subunit will dissociate from the other two subunits, it will move along the membrane and then it will uh, activate an effector protein inside the cell. For example, adenylyl cyclase enzyme. The adenylyl cyclase enzyme will 
कन्वर्ट सेल्युलर ए टी पी इंटू साइक्लिक ए एम पी एंड दिस साइक्लिक ए एम पी इज ऑफन रिफर टू एज द सेकेंड मैसेजर राइट हॉर्मोन इज द ओरिजिनल मैसेजर बट सिंस इट कुड नॉट एंटर द सेल टू एक्सर्ट इट्स इफेक्ट इट हैज इनिशिएटेड दीज दिस चेन ऑफ इवेंट्स टू फॉर्म द सेकेंड मैसेजर and then second messenger cyclic amp will activate the protein kinase a the protein kinase enzyme will be activated and then that will cause uh, that protein kinase particularly will, co will cause uh, phosphorylation of certain uh, uh, proteins or amino acid residues on those proteins and that finally will exhibit or exert the effect of the hormone so phosphorylation of the proteins by the protein kinase Uh, the protein kinase enzyme will exert the effect uh, by uh, acting on those uh, amino acid residues and that will alter the function inside function of that target cell so there may be opening of some channel there may be activation of some other enzymatic machinery uh, so uh, the hormone effect will eventually uh, be exhibited or exerted in this manner that is the g uh, heterotrimeric g protein and the receptor which is coupled with that is a g protein coupled receptor well uh, instead of adenylyl cyclase there can be another effector protein some of some hormones instead of adenylyl cyclase they have another effector protein uh, phospholipase phospholipase c which will uh, Ex, uh, activate some other second messenger so uh, let's uh, have a look at that also some of the hormones or major chunk of hormones many hormones they activate adenylyl cyclase enzyme but some hormones when alpha subunit dissociates from the other two subunits uh then it can also activate phospholipase c enzyme then it acts on uh, phosphatidyl inositol biphosphate phosphatidyl inositol biphosphate that can be written short as pip2 so uh, let me just uh, go a little back and describe the story once again we are talking about the cell membrane receptors so this is a protein or peptide hormone it came it combines with the receptor and this then activates the g protein well so far the story is similar uh g protein uh, has got three subunits alpha beta gamma the alpha subunit dissociates it moves along the membrane and then for some hormones there was activation of adenylyl cyclase enzyme for some other hormones there could be activation of phospholipase c and when that is activated as the effector protein it will act on the phosphatidyl inositol biphosphate which is uh, present inside the cell to form the second messengers which are called as DAG diacylglycerol and inositol triphosphate IP3 inositol triphosphate so the second messengers are different they are the second messenger is not cyclic AMP but it is diacylglycerol and inositol triphosphate which then inositol triphosphate then uh, causes a release of calcium from the intracellular stores it acts on the endoplasmic reticulum and causes release of calcium from the intracellular stores it increases the calcium levels so we can say in effect diacylglycerol and the calcium are the second messengers for this particular pathway right therefore in summary a g protein coupled receptor has uh, basically two second messengers the cyclic amp is one second messenger system and uh, 
diacylglycerol and calcium is another second messenger system right now moving on let's uh, just summarize and read it through once again g protein uh, gtp binding protein gtp is guanosine triphosphate and uh, by acting through this g protein they activate or inactivate some other membrane associated enzyme which we have seen so far and uh, the other receptors are called as catalytic receptors mentioned again the receptor itself has catalytic activity right um, we have described all of this there is a heterotrimeric g protein with alpha beta gamma subunits in inactive form it is bound to gdp and uh, uh, then when hormone binds with the receptor its gdp is released and it it binds with the gtp uh, that uh, g uh, g protein it binds with the gtp alpha subunit dissociates from the beta gamma dimer and moves along the membrane right and it activates downstream effectors like adenyl cyclase or phospholipases um well let's uh, now look at the various hormones and uh, what uh, second messenger do they have so adenylyl cyclase and cyclic amp system is utilized as a second messenger by these hormones acth tsh fsh lh pth glucagon calcitonin secretin catecholamines these are all protein hormones and they use cyclic amp as the second messenger or let's say adenylyl cyclase cyclic amp system <clears throat> whereas the phospholipase system the phospholipase c which we mentioned just now which uh, is going to form which which acts on the phosphatidyl inositol biphosphate and uh, it will convert it will form diacylglycerol and ip3 inositol triphosphate and the calcium that system is used by the hormones which have which are mentioned here angiotensin 2 adh gnrh oxytocin trh and growth hormone releasing hormone so basically the protein or peptide hormones uh, they act via these two types of uh, one of these two types of uh, second messenger systems right uh, let me just add here that the g protein has that alpha subunit now listen to this part as well the g protein has alpha subunit now this alpha subunit may have gs alpha variety or gi alpha subunit the the alpha subunit of the g protein it can be gs alpha or gi alpha uh gs s stands for stimulate stimulatory subunit it's a stimulatory unit so when this alpha subunit is present it will stimulate the adenylyl cyclase enzyme that means it will increase the cyclic amp levels inside the cell whereas the other type is called as gi alpha i stands for inhibitory so this is going to inhibit the adenylyl cyclase enzyme and that means what that means the effect will be to decrease the cyclic amp the point that i am making is some hormones exhibit some of their actions by decreasing the cyclic amp inside the cell okay those actions are inhibitory actions of those hormones and how those inhibitory actions are exerted on the target cell by actually decreasing the cyclic amp inside the target cell and how is that possible because those g proteins in the cell membrane have gi alpha subunit the alpha subunit is gi alpha so inhibitory uh, alpha subunit and therefore inhibition of adenylyl cyclase and decrease cyclic amp levels let me give you the examples i uh, i mentioned that catecholamines 
they use cyclic AMP as the second messenger. That means they are going to increase the cyclic AMP levels inside the target cell. But some of the actions of catecholamines are inhibitory actions. Let me tell you, for example, uh, norepinephrine, it has alpha 2 receptors. Um, alpha 2 receptors, for example, these receptors are located presynaptically and uh, they are called as autoreceptors and they are inhibitory. They inhibit the further release of norepinephrine into the synapse. So, but how this ex effect can be exerted? Norepinephrine acting via alpha 2 receptor exerts the inhibitory effect of norepinephrine. How is that possible? Because this alpha 2 receptor has GI subunit and therefore it is going to decrease the cyclic AMP. Or dopamine, uh, another catecholamine, it has got 5 receptors D1, D2, D3, D4 and D5. So, uh, two of them are inhibitory receptors. I mean, inhibitory uh, effects of dopamine are mediated through these two receptors. For example, D2, D2 dopamine, uh, dopamine receptor mediates the inhibitory effects of dopamine. And how is that possible? Because this receptor will have GI alpha subunit or rather not the receptor, but the G protein uh, which is associated with the receptor will have this subunit. So, uh, inhibitory effect of dopamine can be exerted uh, via this kind of an alpha subunit in the G protein uh, and uh, by decreasing the cyclic AMP levels. So, that was about the G protein coupled receptors and uh, Basically, G protein coupled receptor in the cell membrane, it has got two types of second messenger systems. We have mentioned of this as well. Uh, just one more additional feature. How is this G protein signaling terminated? Well, hormone has come and combined with the receptor. Receptor is the serpentine receptor. Uh, so, uh, the mediator was G protein for the receptor action, the mediator was G protein, G protein's alpha subunit got dissociated. So, all that has happened. Now, how this G protein signaling can be terminated? One is, it has got intrinsic GTPase activity. So, naturally, if there is a GTPase uh, activity present, if it is activated, then uh, the GTP binding protein or G protein uh, activity can be subdued and signal can be terminated. Second is the desensitization and endocytosis of the receptor. You know the receptor that we have shown in the diagram, once the hormone has uh, initiated its action, then the action can be terminated eventually by uh, this receptor, in fact, serpentine receptor. This receptor can be endocytosed and it will be internalized by the cell, by the target cell. And then the hormone action will no longer be possible. The hormone action will be terminated. So, that is another uh, way either the receptor has intrinsic uh, GT pays activity. So, that is how the G protein signaling can, uh, or G protein mediation can be terminated or uh, the receptor can be endocytosed. So, there are enzymes called as GPCR kinases and uh, they phosphorylate the intracellular domain of these GPCRs. So, uh, GPCRs have intracellular domain and that will be phosphorylated. Now, this will recruit a protein called as beta arestin. Recruitment of a protein called as beta arestin. How? When uh, GPCR kinase has been activated, we want to terminate the hormone action. 
So GPCR kinase has been activated and then that will recruit the protein called as beta arrestin. Now this beta arrestin bind, uh, binding inactivates the receptor and also the receptor will be internalized. Endocytosis of the receptor, the receptor got internalized and then the hormone action obviously will stop. So that is a, uh, this is an important mechanism for hormonal desensitization. I mean, we often see that uh, if there is excessive exposure to the hormone, uh, later on what happens is there is desensitization, means the effect goes on decreasing over a period of time, even though the hormone levels are high, but the effect of the hormone wanes over a period of time, decreases, disappears, stops. So that is desensitization. How does that happen? This desensitization happens because of this one mechanism that the receptor can be internalized, recruitment of a protein called as beta arrestin and that will cause endocytosis and internalization of the receptor, that 7 transmembrane segment receptor that will be internalized, hormone action will cease, decrease. Uh, let me add one more point here. G protein, we have seen so far that the G protein is a heterotrimeric G protein. So, it has got three different subunits for which we called it heterotrimeric. But then there are some other types of G protein. The other category is called as monomeric G protein. It has got single subunits, so monomeric. There was heterotrimeric, then there are these monomeric G proteins or also called as low molecular weight proteins. They play an important role in many signaling pathways. So there are five families of such monomeric proteins, uh, the RAS protein, Rho, Rab, RAN and ARF. These are the five types of monomeric G protein and many uh, signaling pathways are mediated by these monomeric G proteins. So that is just an additional fact that I wanted to bring to your notice. Now coming to the, to the second type of receptors. Now look, uh, we saw one which is the G protein coupled receptor and I am speaking this out umpteenth time that hormone combines with the receptor but the receptor has no activity by itself, it binds with the G protein, the G protein is going to initiate the further events. So it is the G protein coupled receptor. Now the other type of receptor is catalytic receptor means the receptor itself has enzymatic activity, catalytic activity or the cytoplasmic tail of the receptor is associated with some kind of an enzyme complex. And therefore, when the hormone combines with the receptor, now there is no mediator, straight action on some enzyme. The action of the, uh, I mean receptor itself can act as an enzyme and can phosphorylate proteins inside the target cell. So such receptors are called as uh, catalytic receptors. Many hormones and growth factors, they have these types of catalytic receptors. So, for instance, receptor guanylyl cyclase, that means the receptor has guanylyl cyclase activity. So, when the hormone comes and combines with the receptor in the cell membrane, right, we are talking about the cell membrane receptor so far. When a hormone combines with the cell membrane receptor, the receptor itself has the guanylyl cyclase enzyme activity and that means inside the cell there is GTP, let us just draw it here, here is a hormone, the particular hormone combines with this receptor and the receptor has intrinsic uh, enzyme activity, the guanylyl cyclase activity. So, it will convert cellular GTP into cyclic GMP. 
So, cyclic AMP has been the second messenger in the case of GPCRs. Here, cyclic GMP will be the second messenger. Cyclic GMP will be the second messenger. And there are two hormones classically known to have cyclic GMP as the second messenger. Those hormones are ANP and NO. Atrial natriuretic peptide and nitric oxide. So, please remember cyclic GMP is the second messenger for two hormones, the ANP and NO. Right. Um, then we have another receptor uh, with catalytic activity, which is receptor tyrosine kinase. Receptor tyrosine kinase, short written as RTK. So, what happens is when the hormone binds with the receptor in the cell membrane, the receptor itself has tyrosine kinase activity. So, the receptor phosphorylates the tyrosine residues uh, on themselves or on the other proteins and therefore that will exert the action of the hormone. Insulin classically is known to have this receptor tyrosine kinase. So, insulin and insulin like growth factors they have this uh, receptor which is called as receptor tyrosine kinase. So, um, receptor itself has intrinsic enzymatic activity. And then tyrosine kinase associated receptor. Look, I mentioned that the membrane receptor can itself has, uh, have this uh, intrinsic en enzyme activity or its cytoplasmic tail is associated with some enzyme complex. Yes, that would be called as tyrosine kinase associated receptor. So, what are the hormones that uh, have this receptor? Growth hormone, prolactin, erythropoietin and leptin. Growth hormone, prolactin, erythropoietin and leptin. Their receptor is said to be tyrosine kinase associated receptor. What really happens is that when the growth hormone enters or rather not enters, growth hormone reaches the target cell and it identifies its, its, its receptor, the cytoplasmic tail of the receptor is associated with the tyrosine kinase enzyme. Yeah? So, please understand the difference between insulin receptor which is called as receptor tyrosine, tyrosine kinase because the receptor itself had tyrosine kinase activity whereas this has got a cytoplasmic tail which is bind with that enzyme complex, the, the tyrosine kinase enzyme. And when the growth hormone combines with the receptor, the tyrosine kinase is activated, then it activates another in machinery inside the cell which is called as jack stat machinery. This uh, machinery will be activated inside the cell. Uh, the, the, the enzymes, the genus kinase enzyme and signal transducer activated transcriptors. So, stat. Um, this will be activated and eventually the effect of growth hormone will be exerted. So, that is a receptor, uh, I mean tyrosine kinase associated receptor and then receptor tyrosine phosphatase, some, some hormone have the receptors which have uh, tyrosine phosphatase uh, activity. So, they cleave the phosphate groups from the tyrosine groups of the cellular proteins. Uh, receptor serine and threonine kinase, serine and threonine kinase, that is also a small family of receptors. So, when a ligand binds with the receptor, the receptor phosphorylates the, not the tyrosine residues this time, it phosphorylates the serine or threonine residues on the cellular proteins. So, it is called as receptor serine or threonine kinase.
um, receptors for TGF beta, transforming growth factor TGF. So the receptor for TGF beta family, they have they are the receptors called as receptor serine threonine kinase. So um, uh, this TGF beta family ha includes the hormone which is called as anti Mullerian hormone. So remember, uh, and of course also inhibin is another hormone which inhibits uh, FSH secretion. It has got uh, some of the other actions as well, reproductive system. So uh, a few hormones have this type of receptor and therefore that we have discussed so far about the cell membrane receptors, right. Uh, now let us talk about the intracellular receptors. If you remember, we started the discussion by saying that receptor is a target biomolecule when the hormone binds with its specific receptor only then the action can be exerted. Peptide or protein hormones, they reach the target cell, but they cannot enter the target cell and therefore their receptors are in the cell membrane itself. So that these hormones do not have to cross the cell membrane and enter the cell. So we talked about the cell membrane receptors and the varieties. Now we are talking about intracellular receptors. And I have already mentioned this that the steroid hormones have intracellular receptors because steroids are lipid soluble, they can enter the target cells very easily. They can cross the lipid by, uh, bilayer. So they can cross the cell membranes uh, and thyroid hormones also have intracellular receptors. So steroids and thyroid hormones have intracellular receptors uh, and vitamin D of course, uh, again a steroid. So a steroid hormone enters the cytoplasm of a cell and it binds with a specific receptor protein in the cytoplasm. Then this receptor hormone complex which is now there in the cytoplasm diffuses into the nucleus or is transported into the nucleus where it binds to the specific DNA sequences inside the nucleus. And then uh, there will be, uh, I mean these receptors therefore, they act as transcriptional regulators. There is going to be DNA transcription and then it will be translated into the cytoplasm formation of mRNA and uh, therefore by that cytoplasm, uh, that transcription will be translated and there would be synthesis of new proteins. That is how the hormone effect will be visible. So, for the glucocorticoids and mineralocorticoids, there is intracytoplasmic receptor. So hormone crosses the cell membrane, enters the cell cytoplasm and binds with the receptor. Let's just draw it. Here is the target cell. Here is a steroid hormone. Let's say a glucocorticoid, cortisol or mineralocorticoid, aldosterone. It crosses the cell membrane, then there is intracytoplasmic receptor. So there is a hormone receptor complex, hormone binds with the receptor and then this complex will enter the nucleus. In the nucleus, it will bind with the specific, uh, it will bind on the specific strands on the DNA, specific sites and therefore there will be DNA transcription and then uh, mRNA translation into the cytoplasm, formation of mRNA and that uh, translation will happen, proteins will be synthesized, new proteins will be synthesized by this. So glucocorticoids, mineralocorticoids, cytoplasmic receptor, estrogen and progesterone, intranuclear receptor means estrogen for example enters the cell, crosses the cytoplasm, reaches the nucleus and binds with the specific uh, sites on the DNA strands. Well, there is also, I mean, this is some uh, debate which is still going on whether the estrogen, estrogen has intracytoplasmic receptor or intranuclear receptor. There is some evidence which is also pointing to the fact that estrogen enters the cytoplasm where it combines with the receptor 
there is a cytoplasmic receptor identified for estrogen and then this complex estrogen receptor complex enters the nucleus to further bind uh, with the DNA strands in the nucleus. So, uh, you know, there are these specific DNA sites or these binding sites on the DNA strands have been also called as hormone response elements, HREs. The DNA strands or the specific sites to which these uh, this hormone receptor complex is going to bind, they have been called as hormone response elements. Um, so, that is how the intracellular receptors are going to work. Basically, glucocorticoid, mineral corticoid, cytoplasmic receptor, estrogen, progesterone and uh, of course, thyroid hormone also, intranuclear receptor. So, receptor and hormone complex diffuses into the nucleus, binds to the specific DNA sequences in the nucleus. So, uh, they are also called as transcriptional regulators. So, there is activation of specific genes to form the messenger RNA and then mRNA diffuses into the cytoplasm again and uh, uh, it will come out in the cytoplasm where it promotes the translation process at the ribosomes and there will be formation of new proteins. So, that is how it happens. The glucocorticoid receptor GR, the mineralocorticoid receptor MR are mainly cytoplasmic, we have already described it. Uh, the thyroid hormone receptor THR and the retinoic acid receptor RXR, they are intranuclear receptors, they are bound to the DNA in the nucleus straight away. So, um, I, and I have also mentioned that the nuclear receptors, they bind, I mean the hormones or receptors, they bind to the specific DNA sequences which are called as hormone response elements, already described, right. Last uh, point is regulation of hormone sensitivity, that there can be down regulation of receptors. A hormone may decrease the number or affinity of receptors for itself or for another hormone. That is called as down regulation of the receptors. And therefore, even though the hormone levels are high, because there is down regulation of receptors, uh, the sensitivity to the hormone and the response to the hormone will go on decreasing. We are now, we have now come to the closing part of this discussion. Mainly, we have described about the receptors, their locations and various hormones which have uh, those receptors. And we have finally come to the last part of uh, this particular video, how the hormone sensitivity can be decreased. So, down regulation of receptors, the hormone sensitivity will decrease. Uh, over a period of time, the number of receptors decreases or affinity of the hormone to the receptor decreases and therefore, hormone, uh, uh, its effect rather will go on decreasing. That is down regulation of receptors, that is how it happens. And uh, up regulation, which means receptor number increases or hormones affinity for the receptor increases and therefore, um, I mean the hormone response will increase. There would be increased sensitivity to the hormone action. That is because of up regulation uh, of uh, the receptors. And then finally, uh, feedback regulation of hormone secretion. We are going to describe this in some other video. Uh, Let us not keep, keep this video uh, too long. So, uh, feedback inhibition of the hormones, that is how uh, the hormone secretion can be controlled. But uh, at least for this particular video, the main focus was on mechanism of hormone action. And even in that, we were talking about the receptor locations and how the hormone binds with those receptors and in some cases how second messenger is activated and which hormones act via what second messenger. We have seen that in a table and then uh, the hormones like steroids, thyroid, intracellular receptors. So, that was the core concept that I wanted you to dis, uh, understand in this particular video.
in the subsequent videos we will discuss the negative feedback regulation and the role of pituitary and hypothalamus how they can exert the controls on uh, the various endocrine glands so for this particular video that's it for now